So while we wait for everyone to come in, what have you all had for breakfast today? <laughs> <laughs> have you had breakfast? Who has time uh, for breakfast, Louisa? What, it's a, it's, it's, what, it's, what a candid it's question. Noon for you, it's, so. It's my favorite does, meal. What does it say about me that it was a cliff bar and already four cups of coffee? <laughs> um, busy. <laughs> yeah, busy, right, exactly. I've had two breakfasts, so. <laughs> yeah, my, mine was uh, leftover salad and uh, coffee out of my wife's mug. So you know, a nice pink mug there. Yeah, you know. we're cruising. We're Sa cruising. Salad <laughs> for breakfast is unusual. Yeah, it was it was what was in the fridge. It was in the fridge, right? <laughs> Needs must. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> have you have you guys found that what you've been eating has changed um, with COVID? You know, the availability of certain things. It's more mm. cooking. Um, so I, I've been basically going to, I've been trying to figure out how to actually cook a steak at home and cook like, I'm trying to like replace all of the things I used to, if we went out for dinner on like date night, I uh, used to get out at a restaurant and teaching myself how to do it, um, which has actually been a bit of fun, oddly enough. Yeah, I'm, I've, I'm kind of getting to the end of my tether with having to cook every meal. <laughs> I'm missing yeah. the city, I'm missing takeouts and I'm missing restaurants. Yeah, it's really yeah, craving I, restaurant food. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I've got a six, seven month old and a two and a half year old, so I've got both dad bod right now, and I have COVID bod, and th those, <laughs> the intersection of those things are pretty <laughs> awful. Uh, my, my diet could really improve by, by eating out at maybe McDonald's or something like that. I think at this point in time, <laughs> certainly less quantities of food. Right, right. A lot of dried goods, you know. Definitely. We've been making a lot of pizza oh. at home. Oh, you have? It's definitely been uh, I've, I've perfected the pizza. Nice. Um, all right. Well, I think we can probably start getting going. So thank you to everyone for joining this webinar about robotics and automation in food and agriculture. Um, as many of you all know, you know, COVID-19 pandemic has been putting a lot of pressure on our food system and it's becoming increasingly clear that we need more automation, whether that's in food processing, the meat packing plant closures are a case in point there, or whether it's on the farm where many different nations are struggling um, with their harvests and you're seeing whole farm workforces come down with the virus. But is the technology ready to scale? If we look at investment numbers in farm robotics, according to our numbers, it was only about $200 million that was invested in startups in robotics on the farm last year. Um, and you know, we really haven't seen a significant pool of startups in the space. Having said that, we've got two, two of great ones um, on our session today. Uh, we have a Gino Caffiero, who's the co-founder of Bear Flag Robotics on the West Coast and Josh Lessing, the co-founder of Root AI over here on the East Coast. And we have AgFunders founding partner, Rob Leclerc. So Rob, to kick things off, can you talk a little bit about how AgFunders been looking at robotics? It's taken us some time to make our first investments, but we've you know, done a bit of a deep dive in recent months. And now we've made a few, including Root AI, so disclosure there. So can you tell us a bit about what you've learned about the state of robotics in agri-food and you know, what to look out for? Yeah, so um, maybe I'll start off. So my background, um, you know, I did a master's in AI and, and virtual robotics, and um, that maybe says how old I am because real robotics were really expensive at the time. So we kind of virtualized everything. Um, and, uh, and so maybe it's surprising that it took us so long, but this is a, like a, both a holy grail problem and a, just a really, really hard problem. You know, I think in general, much of what we see um, in farm tech is the substitution of labor with capital, right? So uh, we use chemicals because it's uh, convenient, effective, um, and it's a lot easier than standing over a plant, uh, attending to a plant sort of individually. Uh, now, again, we've used chemicals for that uh, uh, largely, and we've used a lot of different types of mechanization. Uh, but you know, again, the holy grail here is a, a full automation. Um, and, and this brings us sort of to the next piece of this is that in effect, agriculture um, is really a manufacturing process, but it's sort of like 10x or maybe even 100x harder than uh, traditional manufacturing. You know, if you're, if you're producing an iPhone or, um, or a car, um, you don't have to deal with genetic variants, phenotypic variants, environmental variants. Um, you don't have to worry about an iPhone breaking and then because that one broke, 
the one next to it broke or um, or your, your car running away on you um, or ripping the building off and, and uh, being subject to torrential rain and trying to manufacture in those kinds of uh, circumstances. Um, so so it, in, in effect, it's a really hard problem. So it's not sort of surprising that it's taken a long time for us to actually even have the technology stack that allows us to make this a tractable problem. So, you know, thinking about a little bit about sort of like the why now and the technological improvements, you know, about nine years ago, we started making um, significant breakthroughs in AI, particularly with uh, you know, kind of a breakthrough paper on deep learning algorithms. Um, now we have actually, you know, a couple generations of, of PhD scientists uh, trained in the state of the art. Um, we've had the evolution of, of software packages, starting with sort of CUDA and then TensorFlow and Keras and sort of building up this stack that allows engineers to, to solve problems faster and easier. Uh, we've had a 300x improvement even just since 2015 in processing speed, particularly uh, with the introduction and in, in integration of, of GPUs. Um, and these are, these are processes that perform hyper fast matrix multiplication and are originally used in the gaming industry, uh, but you use matrix multiplication in, uh, in, in, in artificial intelligence as well. And so this is sort of brought in. Um, and then you've got the piece dividends from, from the driverless car industry, right? So you've got cameras today that didn't even exist uh, 10 years ago or, uh, you know, without the driverless car industry would have been effectively, pre, pre, you know, prohibitively expensive. Um, and so there's sort of all of this has come together, you know, for us in kind of 2020, 2019, um, that, that answers this, this why now question. And I think, you know, automation is interesting because it's where we're seeing some of the greatest success in ag tech today. And so you, we always talk about, you know, adoption challenges and do farmers understand the value? Um, and, and they don't want more data, right? They want solutions. Um, and and auto, with automation, you're generally giving them something they're already paying for. So the ROI and the value proposition is already quite clear, which, which mitigates um, some of those adoption concerns. And so, you know, our own entry point into automation actually came with an investment in Solon F Tech. Um, and so Solon F Tech is a, a farm management company and uh, a software package. And, and what all of the other farm management companies that we had encountered were working on were either ERP or they were working um, around making improvements around agronomy. And Solon F Tech came at it from the standpoint of process um, process automation. So if agriculture is a manufacturing process, how do we create all of these efficiencies and run a process and have software do this? And so today, you know, they tell equipment operators where and when they need uh, to be on the field. And they sort of have a whole set of applications um, by which to, um, you know, orchestrate a farm. So they, they you know, this whole NFTC is sort of the central executive um, scheduling everybody's activity um, and, and is kind of aware of what's going on in the field at any given time. And, and what we saw with them was just it, like, when we met with them, we were just so shocked on like, they basically had 0% customer churn, right? You're thinking of product market fit as, as this intersection of zero churn and, and, and growth in your business. Um, this just, we just sort of latched onto that. And um, this then led to a subsequent investment in field in, uh, which, does all, uh, which is very similar to Solon Ethic, but instead of sort of row crops, they, they focus on high value crops. And similarly, it was sort of Solon Ethic's investment that led us to field in and, and we recognize some of these patterns. Um, and so the next step then is, okay, well, Solon Ethic and, and field in are talking to, to, you know, telling the equipment operators where and when they need to be it's just a sort of a next step before they need to talk to the equipment, but they're not trying to solve that problem. Uh, directly. So this is where you need um, automation. Um, and so, you know, this is this sort of was a, a journey that we went down where it was very clear that the time was now um, and, and, and that the te technology was there. So we've invested in uh, Root AI. Uh, we've also invested in uh, Avernet Robotics, which is an incredible team uh, founded by the ex chief science officer at Zeus. It's like a $3 billion driverless car company and engineers who came from cruise automation and, and Google's driverless cars. And you just wouldn't have seen that, um, you know, four years ago, for instance, you didn't, you didn't see the level of talent and you didn't see the, the, the technological capabilities to really make this um, a, a challenge, challenging problem. So it's a, it's a little bit about what we're, um, you know, how, what brought us down this path and, and what, uh, what got us here today. 
great. And so why did we invest in Root AI? Or maybe, I mean, maybe Josh, you can give us a little intro on, on what you do at Root AI and then Rob, you can say why they're so great. Sure. So what we're focused on uh, at our core at Root is robotic dexterity for food. You know, um, when you take a look at um, the specialty section of agriculture, so, you know, the things that get your tomatoes, your cucumbers, your peppers onto your dinner table, that's a section of agriculture that has not experienced the volume of automation solutions. Uh, and by automation solutions, I mean very broadly that, you know, if you have a tractor pulling a tool that is doing what used to be the job of many people, a lot of those sorts of solutions don't exist in specialty. And uh, what it really comes down to is replicating this in those growing environments. So at our core, we're focused on the artificial intelligence packages that teach a machine how to functionally interact with those crops, care for them, harvest for them. But at the same time, since we're creating eyes in the farms, uh, in the farm, collecting data from, from that grow and being able to create actionable insights for growers around that, really going back to uh, what Rob was talking about where what farmers, farmers don't want data, they want, um, they, want in, they want insights that become automatic action. And so that's what we're building. We're beginning with uh, greenhouse farms uh, that grow a variety of the specialty crops that you have in the grocery store and expanding from there. Okay, great, and any particular crops that you started focusing on or? Quite, uh, we absolutely love tomatoes. Uh, it is one of the most commonly eaten items around the world has to be delivered fresh. It's not a, an easy thing to grasp, uh, but that's one of our major specialties. And there is a lot of needs uh, in the industry to solve that very specific problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as, well, you know, as far as our, um, you know, investment in Root, I think if, if there, was a, there was a bunch of things. Um, certainly uh, Josh um, is a, a you know, very capable uh, founder was, you know, that's sort of always the baseline for us. and. Um, he's sort of being a little bit modest here, but his, his, his postdoc at Harvard uh, led to the formation, or it was a key research piece in, uh, in soft robotics, um, where, where he worked at for, what, five or five or six years? Five years. So I was, um, I was at Harvard working with Professor George Whitesides on commercialization of his technology. Uh, what we ended up going out into the market with was uh, the soft robotics uh, actuator platform, which is now its own field of engineering. Yeah, and so what, you, what is you, soft robotics? Sorry, so it's everyone? so it's an unconventional way of making robots, and that uh, robots are typically built out of hardened parts, hardened actuators, uh, mimicking body plans from uh, like a human hand or a horse or a dog. And we were asking this question: What if you used a fundamentally different material set, uh, deformable materials, plastics, rubbers? And what if you started building robots based on unconventional body plans, things like squids? And what would be the end result of that? And the end result, uh, we were told by a lot of people that our robots would never do what robots do, and the answer was right. But it started doing a lot of the things that, that humans did and that we were able to create, um, I was able to invent a, a robot hand that's now used throughout the food industry in uh, food processing and packaging that can delicately manipulate uh, arbitrary food objects quickly, effectively, without damage, and is the world's most sanitary uh, robot hand, and that you could do uh, ready-to-eat meat, cheeses, all the things you need to be worried about. It's where uh, myself and my co-founder spent many years uh, just studying how robots touch and interact with food, and was uh, the learnings that was core to the thesis that created Root. Yeah, so, so you don't really find often people who, you know, have great product or sorry, founder market fit in this space, um, in particular, because this is such a new space and having, you know, spent the last five years building and, and shipping, ro uh, you know, robots and articulated arms that could actually work um, in sort of non-traditional um, environments uh, was, was really great. And then also, you know, in the greenhouse space, you know, you, you fly into the Netherlands and you see the amount of greenhouses that are there. And you think, wow, what if the rest of the world had something like this, right? Um, and, and what is holding it back? And we're certainly seeing, you know, especially with COVID, uh, a, a real, you know, I think a refocusing on the localization of food, shorter distances between, uh, you know, pick to plate. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think this is a key piece of this. So I think we are, you've seen massive growth in greenhouses, um, in tomatoes, you're starting to see this now in cucumbers, 
in um, in strawberries. Uh, you know, whereas indoor agriculture, as a pure indoor agriculture, um, is you know you're not really taking advantage of all of the benefits of of the sun, right? I mean, it's free energy that you get. So we think that there's a, a tremendous amount of mileage that you can get from greenhouses um, and improve them, and then automation of this and the, you know the harvesting, um, it, it cutting, etc. Is is uh, there's a, there's an enormous opportunity there, and and so this is just, you know Josh is really the most advanced team we had come across um, in this space. And so, are you focused mostly on the harvesting, or is it is it activities throughout the growth cycle? So uh, for the time being, it is the harvesting. When you take a look at how uh, labor is distributed across the farm, uh, specifically for a lot of the things that are in high retail demand. Uh, snackable pieces of produce, so grape and cherry tomatoes, strawberries, cucumber, mini cucumbers, um, you're looking at 50% plus of labor is involved in the harvest. It's also, um, it's important to note that it's the, the critical control point in a farm and that every single effort you've made throughout the year, it, it all culminates in capturing that piece of food in time uh, at the, the peak of quality. So it's one of the most painful things for um, a grower to experience is to lose that harvest. And in more general, uh, just thinking about being product centric, uh, you always need to develop solutions that, uh, that capture someone's attention. Probably the most limited resource in any customer operation, particularly farms, is, is the farm manager's attention. So if you don't have a solution that um, has two, co two core qualities, one is tackling a massive problem at that farm, and two, um, there's a really good closed loop feedback cycle where it's really easy on any given day to attribute a success to your product. You really don't have their attention, which means in annual planning meetings, no one's making your innovation a focus of their team for the coming year. That's a really good point, Josh. So Gino, tell us about Bear Flag. <laughs> hey guys. Um, yeah, I totally agree with Josh's last point. That was really well said. So Bear Flag Robotics builds autonomous technology for farm tractors. Um, we don't build the machines themselves. We build the technology that goes on them. So um, our model is to procure the machines, um, either use our customers' machines or rental fleets, add our technology to them, and then deploy them back to growers um, for a compelling ROI. Um, the idea is that every month that you farm with Bear Flag is a month that you save on your op operational expense and increase your productivity. Great. And and which which activities are are you focused on? So right now um, we do uh, tillage, um, basically soil prep, um, primary and secondary tillage, um, which is a great task to do. Um, we uh, we're crop agnostic. Um, we're we're out there literally five five or six days a week. Um, doing tillage. Now, we've also demoed spring um, and have a, a roadmap for other applications behind the tractor as well, um, but focused on, on soil prep. And so yeah, really, I, it's... I, I'm going to jump in on that because I, I think he's probably underselling how awesome this is as, as well. So they've got um, this 370 horsepower John Deere tractor on treads. Um, and you basically, you've got, you know, you, if you see Google Wimo, for instance, they've got a whole bunch of camera lidar equipment around this thing so they drop this package on um and uh, and it's it's an impressive to see uh we, we we went and visited a gino and and the team and you know we, we got we got a drive a, a ride in the driverless tractor um it is impressive to see this on the field and i think you know on, on tillage as well it's interesting right i mean people say okay tillage but you know normally you think you've oh, so you've got you know tillage you've got planting you've got spraying you've got harvesting sort of four kind of main buckets. Uh, obviously, Josh is in sort of the harvesting side, Agino's right at the, at the front end. Um, planting and spraying, right, is actually where you can cause a lot of damage, right? Like, as, as far as tillage goes, like, these are really, really hard problems. And so I think it's really important when you're going at the space to go, don't solve the hardest problem that there is, go solve the easiest problem. And this is why we're seeing the challenges in the driverless car industry. We're seeing engineers leave this space because they're, they're looking at this and saying, look, it's going to be another decade before we actually you know, fix every single edge case and they, and they want to build shippable products. Um, and so, in, and it may seem simple on the surface, but you get into it and you think about all of the edge cases, all of the uptime, don't make your problem harder than it needs to be. Um, you know, in something like tillage, you, you could have like, you know, in California here, say 1500 acres, you're going to till each one of those acres you know, 15 times. And if you're doing, uh, you know, you might have like two and a half crop turns a year, right? So, you I mean, 
you could have three tractors basically running every day, 10 hours, 12 hours a day, even 24 hours a day, um, you know, tilling where, uh, and so these are, this, is a, a, this is a labor intensive activity um, and, and robots don't need to, you know, take bathroom breaks and they can have tons of precision. You can really un get fidelity and, and, and repeatability in what you're doing. So I, I, it's, I, I, guess I wish we had some videos here to, to kind of show it. You've got to really have to see it to appreciate um, yeah. um, how special this is. No, Rob, that was a great endorsement. One of the things that you sort of touched on as well as simplifying the problem, right? So finding a very applied use of technology to solve a crucial problem. And time and time again, at Bear Flag, um, we've, we've, we've asked, how can we simplify this? How can we go to market more quickly? How can we provide more utility to growers as soon as possible? Um, and I won't, I won't you know, take you on the journey of sort of our product market fit, um, but it started as a much more complex product. And every time we boil it down to how can we deliver utility as soon as possible. And, and this is how we've done it. I mean, we consider we have these two major challenges at Verifyag. One is building safe, reliable, autonomous technology that can do the job better than a human can. And the other side is taking it to market. Um, and as, as Josh can probably empathize with, these are, these are new products that don't exist in agriculture and they require new go-to-markets and new ways of interacting with customers and supporting customers and having customers interact with autonomous equipment on their land. And that's one of the fascinating parts of the problem we're solving. And there's really as much innovation on the tech side as there is on the go-to-market side, um, directly, directly to your point. Yeah, I mean, the one, one of the things that like you, on, on tillage, right? Um, if, you could, if you could till 24 hours, this gives you more turns on the farm, right? And this is something you can't even do. So there's, there's not only just, hey, let's, let's substitute and let's solve a labor problem, right? It's like, uh, let's, let's do something we can't even do today that gives us, that, that allows these farms to be far more profitable um, and productive with the time that they do have, which, which I think is quite special. Oh, absolutely. And that, that ties right into... You know, I, on, on the surface, Bear Flag appears to be a, a cost-saving device, um, but I think that's really limiting and it upper bounds of um, what we're capable of. When we start thinking about how can Bear Flag inform agronomic decisions through the data that we're collecting, how can Bear Flag um, improve efficiency and productivity in ways that humans can't do today, that's really exciting, right? When we think about in California, you know, we do between 2.4 and 2.6 turns of lettuce per year. If Bear Flag technology can increase that to three. That's a massive improvement. Holy smokes, not only to top line revenue for these growers, but also just to food production in general. Um, super impactful. Okay, digging into that, um, the business model and the go-to-market strategy, I think that's that's really interesting. And, is, and as you mentioned, has been a challenge for startups getting out there. Um, you know, farmer margins are, are very low. They can't necessarily afford to be purchasing more equipment. So can you talk a bit about what your business model is? Maybe Josh, you could start. Sure, so we're, for our early adopters, we're interacting with them through a robots as a service model. And, and quite specifically, it's, you know, so right now uh, farm workers get paid off of the OPEX budget. They're compensated on a piece rate basis and those people are unavailable. So if you wanna have a great conversation with the grower, uh, one of the easy ways to have that conversation transpire quickly get to how do I implement this as opposed to how do I debate the value proposition is to offer the technology in the same way they pay for the exact same task right now. So right now when people interact with our robots, uh, they're paying per kilo harvested the same way that labor is comp compensated. Uh, farmers instantaneously then grasp what your tech does and how it will be implemented. And then you start getting into the real conversation of, you know, when do the machines arrive? How many hours a day do I have them work? Um, long term, there's, I would say that there's a lot of different ways to monetize these technologies. Um, you know, AgBots is no different from any of a variety of B2B automation solutions in that, you know, if you have a really, really good customer value proposition, you know, that's, that's the core and you can seek to monetize in a variety of ways. Uh, right now, farmers like, you know, just like a warehouse operator or a lot of other people in automation, they have small margins. Uh, they take a lot of risks. They don't necessarily want to take a risk on your product. So engaging with them through a services model is a great way to get started. Yeah, what well, do you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, think, um, I think the consensus among most folks in agrobotics is that this needs to be a service. And that's certainly a thesis that, you know, bear flags have for a long time, that autonomous looks like a service in agriculture long before it's a product. And we're moving along that continuum, right? Um, 
today, um, you know, historically Bear Flag has done tillage as a service on a per acre basis. Um, but we're, what we hear from our customers is that they want to operate those machines themselves. And so now we get into a hybrid model of customers operating machines, but Bear Flag is right there to help them. Um, ultimately moving to customers are operating their machines and Bear Flag can help with over-the-air support, teleops, um, insights, um, things like that. But it is a continuum and it's not ready um, for, you know, product level um, deployment today, but that shouldn't stop us, right? We need to get that out there as soon as possible, learn the lessons, develop the tech, understand how growers want to interact with our hardware. And also too, by the way, um, building up, you know, our, our data set too, to make our, our product more robust and um, speaking about our company's defensibility, building up that defensible moat around our operations, meaning that we could, in three years, we'll be able to do this much better than a newcomer can. Um, and so that's crucial to the strategy as well. Of, of course, it has to be. Mm -hmm. Rob, what have been some of the different business models you've seen come in through startups we've looked at? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think when it when it comes to to the physical robot, I, I, I think that, you know, the robots as a service just makes the most sense as a go to market. I think people will look at this over time and say, look, um, you know, I, I may want to own that piece of equipment and I want to run it into the ground kind of thing. Um, in the beginning, though, the value proposition is the easiest, right? You're really it's a kind of a one-to-one -one substitution. They're paying for X. They know how much they're supposed to pay for it. There's not, you know, and, and so the, you, you know, they kind of, you're paying for functional outcome. Um, and so I think, you know, this makes the most sense from a go-to market perspective. I do think over time that the service model gets harder and harder for any kind of startup because just the, the complexity to manage such a hands-on process um, that you kind of really need to hand this over to you know, agronomists and, and farm operators um, and whatnot. But that's sort of a, a separate problem. I think today it's, it, it's actually beneficial because you need to spend time with the grower and learn, right? So there's a slog involved in like, you know, the first three, four, five years of like, look, we need to learn as much as possible. We need to be on the farm. Somebody's effectively gonna su subsidize our R&D in this, right? And, and add that for me is actually, really makes this really defensible because let's say John Deere wants to come along um, and do the exact same thing. Um, it's not like they can, it's not like Google driverless cars where they can just put somebody in it, uh, you know, buy a fleet and say, you know, go drive around. Um, they need to actually work through multiple seasons, right? I mean, it's just, there's a rate limiting factor by which even large companies uh, can move. Um, and so this sort of, there's a, there's sort of this experience curve that is, you need to go down. So uh, it, it really fits well, this robots as a service model really fits well with sort of that three, first three to five years of operations. Absolutely. One, one other thing I'll add to um, echoing exactly what Rob said, uh, when we think of as a service in California, um, there's this, you know, temptation to think this is a lot of small farms that are sort of running around um, trying to do as much as possible. In fact, in California, um, the top 20 farms get bear flag to our first $100 million of ARR. So it's a really small number of customers that represents a tremendous amount of value for our company. And if we focus on those, um, we'll be set for the foreseeable future for sure. It's also actually another really good point there in that um, for a lot of these opportunities as a service, uh, they're hyper ge uh, geographically concentrated, right? So if you want to stand up a services operation in the Central Valley of California for Agbot X, uh, you can capture huge chunks of that market in one geo, makes us, the service uh, easy to run. Exactly. Yeah. So a, a, lot, a few questions coming in, and I forgot to mention at the beginning, people can submit questions throughout the conversation in the Q&A box or the chat box, but we've already got some coming in. But just before I get into some of those, why are there so few uh, robotic startups across food and ag. I mean, I think Rob, you know, you touched on a bit of that before, but you know, is it that they struggle in the early stages? It's difficult as a VC investment, you know, hardware is hard and, and all that, you know, what is, what's gonna change? What's gonna be a trigger to make a change there? Yeah, I mean, I think one of it is, is, is frankly kind of financing. Uh, it's gonna sound a little bit elitist, but you hear VCs all the time say, look, if if this team didn't go one of the top sort of you know five or six schools to focus on 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 robotics, uh, this is one of the world's hardest problems, um, and so they're just not going to get behind it, right? So so venture you need this is going to need venture capital dollars, and so you need uh, a team with kind of pedigree and history of exceptionalism that is actually backable, right? So so that that would be um, one, um, but two again, I think 
it, there's a technology trigger that that's sort of, and it's maybe not a sharp trigger, but it's been it's been a sharp inflection point um, over the last um, you know two or three years. We're starting these companies, uh, you know, five or six years ago would have been impossible, right? So we, we and so these is kind of the first generation of companies that are attacking this problem because it's finally um, finally tractable, right? And uh, and then you know, and so it's it's VC dollars and and then you know technology triggers that make it tractable. In my in my opinion, did you know, Josh? I mean, what's your experience? Um, and like, why now? Like, what, what could you guys have done this? Yeah, uh, I would, I would say that's, that's spot on. Um, there are, all, I mean, people have been going after, you know, autonomous uh, harvesting robots, like what we're doing. It's got, uh, I was talking with some folks in orchard crop and they had prototypes going back 40 years and 40 years ago, the tech didn't exist. Um, people talk a lot about, um, you know, advances in convolutional neural networks. I would say that that is impactful, but really the edge computing uh, has massively changed things. You know, uh, when you're when you're out in a massive uh, outdoor field, uh, Wi-Fi isn't exactly uh, your friend, uh, especially when you're in specialty and you're deep inside a crop row, surrounded by plants. There are physical reasons why uh, communications there isn't as possible uh, these days. You know, every single year, massively more capable chipsets are coming out that allow us to deliver. Uh, artificial intelligence all the way down to, you know, being in front of the plant, doing that compute there, uh, doing more complex models. And that's really what's shifting things. You know, there's been this um, incremental story around, you know, batteries are have more storage capacity, sensors are getting cheaper, robot arms are getting cheaper. And that's kind of been chipping away at the problem. But I would say the, the dam broke open moment would be those uh, system on module computers. Yeah, I think that's true. Um... The one other challenge I'll add um, is just team building, right? Um, we've been, um, you know, remarkably successful at recruiting an incredible team, but it's diverse backgrounds, right? So we have um, folks from aerospace, folks who've um, built robotic robots at other companies, um, but we also have ag folks on the team too. Um, you know, our, our ops uh, manager comes, is third generation farmer from Illinois um, understands ag inside and out. And so bringing these experts from different disciplines into the room and having really good conversations about how to build products for farmers has been crucial. And then to actually getting out and doing it. Um, you know, there's this, there's this push and pull between R&D and operations. And I think you can't really have one without the other without, um, without compromising. And so, um, you know, like I said, every single day of the week, we're out at farms doing ops. This is um, this is our ops screen behind me. We have it on at the office, seeing what our tractors are doing in the wild. Um, and you know what? Um, there's there's bugs that come up. We need to fix them. Um, there's challenges. There's really frustrating days out in the middle of the summer when nothing's working, um, and we got to figure it out. We got engineers on the phone, and we got ops people in the field, and it, it can be tremendously frustrating. But that's what you need to do. Um, that's what it's going to take to get these robots out there and, and get them working. Um, and so, just circling back, having the right people on board, having the right people on the team has been crucial for us. So we had a question from Mont Hadley about that, talking about bandwidth in rural regions. You know, what needs to happen there to be able to support your tech, assuming that your products require that substantial bandwidth? Yeah. Um, you know, for us, um, this talk, you know, quite pragma pragmatically, and I don't know if folks on the call will love to hear this answer, um, when we just come back to simplifying the problem, you know, how can, um, how can we be successful narrowing the scope of the problem. And one of the things that we've discovered here in California um, is that most of the farms that we work on do have enough bandwidth through LTE um, to be effectively remote commanded and controlled. We have um, low latency WebRTC um, video streams coming off our tractor. You can see those any, you know, anywhere in the world. And um, we have um, telemetry streaming off these machines in real time constantly. Um, and 4G LTE has been sufficient for that in California. Now, as we think about moving to the Midwest, things do need to change. Um, and talking to growers about setting up their own local networks, their own, own local um, 4G towers is, is certainly something that we consider. Um, but um, case in point here in California, knowing your customer um, and doing as much as we can as quickly as possible, we've had to punt on, on building communication infrastructure for now. Okay, question from Jeff Caldwell. Hi, Jeff. Uh, one major theme that's been uncovered by the COVID situation, specifically in the meat processing sector, is the idea of efficiency versus resilience. The pork supply chain, for example, is enormously efficient, but completely lacking resilience. Building resilience sacrifices efficiency, but we're learning how important it is to have at least some balance between the two. 
So how do you consider resilience as a motivator for this type of technology in the context of its balance with efficiency? I mean, actually, I would say that um, I don't think you necessarily need to compromise, at least for the problems that I'm thinking about. And a lot of the problems that we, we, we would tackle at SoftSoft still tackles is uh, meat industry. There are uh, solutions now that can, uh, you know, carve up a, a, a meat carcass and portion it. Uh, there are solutions that can effectively package it. Um, you know, these are newer things. These are things that have evolved as technologies in the last five years. Uh, there are now robotic solutions that are clean in place uh, so that you can power wash a robot with caustic and sanitize it. I think um, we can have resilience and COVID has um, you know, basically shed light on this problem such that plant managers will start to look out into the world, look for solutions and discover that a lot of the things that they seek have recently been invented and are completely ready to be implemented. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, um, you know, I think a lot of the adoption in, in automation will be accelerated actually by lenders, right? So you've got lenders who are lending to uh, plants, to greenhouses, uh, to farms. Um, and they, I think the question comes up with COVID, um, how do you have continuity of operations if people get sick or working too close together? Um, because they need to service that debt. And so I think lenders come at this and start to have a plan, a, a risk mitigation plan in place. And if you are managing risk in any uh, way, shape or form, I think you have to have come in, especially long term loans. Uh, you have to come in with the assumption that, look, um, you know, over the last 20 years, we have uh, you know, SARS. MERS, swine flu, and now COVID-19, in 20 years from now, we could look back and say, yeah, that was, uh, COVID-19 was, was, was bad. Um, or we could look at, back at and say, look, we actually had two of those, or you know, one was worse. Um, and if I'm, if I'm a lender who's got a 10-year or 20-year loan out, I need to factor that in. It's like, what happens if, if I don't get paid for six months because there's a, an, another pandemic? Um, what automation do you have that will allow this operation to continue in an essential industry. So I, I, I do think that's kind of an important driver and adopter as well. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Mujahid Raji has, is asking for your thoughts on autonomous agriculture in regions with low mechanization rates like sub-Saharan Africa, where traditional farm machinery is too expensive for most farmers. How do you think agrobotics can help? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that specifically. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll reframe the question just a little bit. Um, so when, when, you know, when we're building a company, we think about, you know, this is a high tech solution and there's some costs involved. And, you know, later in the call, we can get into the ROI for growers here in the States, but we'd sort of overlooked emerging markets, um, certainly in the short run as a place that would want to adopt bear flag because the cost of running bear flag would be significantly higher than the cost of labor in those regions. Um, and to our surprise, um, that's actually not been the case. So talking to growers, for example, in Brazil, it really comes back to an availability of labor problem. Um, they, they struggle, you know, just as U.S. growers do too, to find qualified, dependable um, workers or laborers um, who can operate their machines day in, day out. And so there's a willingness to pay on top of the existing wage rate for deterministic, efficient operations. Um, and so we're actually getting a lot of pull from those regions. The automation also um, helps address management issues, particularly at sort of large scale farms, right? I mean, like if you're trying to operate some a, a company that has 10,000 people, I mean, this is a this is a kind of a big headache, right? So the 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 lower the headcount that you can have, the the more you can kind of effectively manage those operations. Um, and then the other thing, right, is um, you can think about solutions. So uh, drone spraying in China, where it's small acreages, um, has been really on the rise. Um, and so this is sort of a case where it's not even really a labor issue. It's just like you have something that can do something new. Um, you see the locust swarms in Africa. I was talking to Kip Tom, um, who's uh, the other day. So, uh, and uh, Kip is a UN ambassador, U.S. ambassador to the UN for food and agriculture, and 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 he's been you know kind of really focused on this problem and thinking about how can we use automation, how can we use drone technologies, something to help solve this particular issue. So I do think there's there's a potential for, uh, for applications, particularly for new new kind of form factors. Mm. And it could be that the the larger the larger corporations that are controlling those supply chains would be essentially be the, the buyers of this technology. Say the you know OLAMs of the world across Southeast Asia could be deploying it across their their farms. Yeah, um, particularly uh, particularly could have sustainability aspects of it as well. Right. Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay, questions are coming in thick and fast. So Jeff Johnson is asking, how would Bear Flag and Root AI describe um, the marginal operating conditions of their technologies? For example, success stories from operating in challenging physical, environmental, or other conditions. Um, yeah, I, I can go quickly first. Um, so one of the thing, one of the happy sort of um, you know um, byproducts of of our our company or or. Uh, um, forcing functions of our companies, you know, we don't need to operate in snowstorms, like for example, right? Um, we don't need to operate in hurricanes um, because you just don't, you don't take trips through the field with your tractor in those conditions. Um, and so we do have a bounding box around sort of the capability or requirements needed from our machines. That being said, um, some cool things that I often point out, um, you know, we work 24 hours a day. Um, you know, we, we work through the night quite frequently as a company. Um, and the, the happy side effect is actually our sensor, our sensor suite works better at night um, typically there's less wind, um, the thermal cameras will pop a lot more, um, and, and we can actually see increased performance of at night, which is not, you know, not how humans sort of perceive the world. And so there's some, actually some benefits um, to being able to work around the clock. Josh, did you want to add anything? Oh, um, yeah, I would have... say that um, core to our thesis is um, going to market, avoiding those challenges. So uh, greenhouses themselves, um, you know, when you you never want to automate a bad process. Um, that's just true broadly in automation. And one of the things that's super appealing about greenhouse growers is when you build a 200 acre, you know, fully closed loop controlled growing building, you've heavily structured your environment. Uh, you drive for um, refining processes, whether or not those are things that relate to my robot or other things, they, they do that across the board. And so you've created these conditions in which crops are presented uh, beautifully. Uh, there's a roof over your head, so you're not exposed to weather. They have the capacity to control the climate within the greenhouse. All of those things unbelievably are unbelievably enabling for robots, right? Because robots uh, in general are always plagued by edge cases. You know, that's why uh, robots appeared in auto manufacturing back in the 60s but haven't existed out in the world with humanity uh, you know, over that time span. Uh, so for us, that's a, a very intentional strategy to pick a place in, uh, that both has services, a big chunk of the market, you know, over 70% of the tomatoes you get at like the big grocery retailers, those are coming from greenhouses. So it's a great market opportunity to also work in a place where uh, robots are destined to thrive. I, I just add to that, um, I mean, if you look at a, a picture of a, of a greenhouse, you know, a high tech greenhouse in say New York, then you go to the Netherlands and then you go to say Saudi Arabia, um, you know, these things are, are pretty invariant, right? And I think that's really important. In, in, if you're looking at <clears throat> any type of robotics company is solve the simple, like these are really, really hard problems. Don't, don't let yourself be fooled. Solve the easiest problem you can. Uh, remove as, as many degrees of freedom that you can so you get some sort of, sort of kernel of operational value and then you can build up from there, right? But, but trying to solve, boil the ocean is, is, is gonna be probably, you know, uh, unlikely to lead to success, so. Florian Richter is asking you, Rob, what advice you can give on early stage funding? Are VCs more reluctant than ever to fund businesses with long R&D time frames and high capex? And how can founders overcome this? Yeah, I mean, if, if, it's, if it's sort of seed and series A, I actually think there's still opportunity in the market. You know, it's the series B and C that is scaring the hell out of VCs right now because that's very large teams, uh, very large checks, and a lot of uncertainty about sort of the operational environment. Where you, if you're seed in series A, um, it's going to be focused on, look, we recognize there's sort of an R&D kind of segment to all of this. Um, I, again, I think it, it's going to really come down to what is the, the founder market fit um, with this particular technology, do you have the team in place to, you know, walk down Sand Hill Road and speak with the top, you know, ten billion dollar funds? Um, and and you have to be realistic about that because that's go going to be what it takes um, to 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 do it. It's not just about an idea. You know, venture capital is really kind of the, a, a people business, not an idea business. So, okay, Merritt Jenkins, question for you, Josh. As you know, there are a number of startups now seriously working on autonomous harvesting of strawberries, tomatoes, sweet peppers, and apples. Which crop will be have automated harvest first? That will be commonplace first, and what is the time frame? So the the ones that we're focusing on are uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, and uh, strawberries, and I think those are all great opportunities. 
Um, and you know, we're actually kicking off uh, full commercial operations uh, next month. So I would say very soon. Um, as far as uh, what we're doing that's distinctive at the business is we're very much seeking from the ground up uh, to go cross crop. So, you know, one thing that I think a lot of people who build robots miss is that no one wants a, a robot, they want a solution. And uh, the thing that farmers used to get uh, from a workforce was that agility, where, you know, what you want to do is figure out what is the best thing that your land can grow and what is it that retailers are asking for. Sometimes that means uh, changing varietals uh, season over season. Sometimes it can mean uh, changing what crop is grown in that location entirely. So, you know, what we're focused on is how do we architect a system from the ground up that can uh, pick multiple different crops so that what a farmer has is an automated workforce. Yeah, I, I would add, I think there's a, um, there, there's a Kiwi picking robot um, that's, that's pretty far along. I think it's Yamaha back in uh, New Zealand. And then mm -hmm. there's Abundant Robotics, uh, which is a pretty advanced um, apple picking robot as well. So, I mean, I think we're pretty much on the cusp of seeing these kinds of activities in, in ag. Great. Vincent Vidal is asking, what is a realistic R ROI for an ag robot in tillage or harvesting? And he's also curious to know how long it takes for a robot to pay for itself. How much is charged per kilos or acre, for instance? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go first on that. Um, you know, critical to our pricing is making sure that growers appreciate an ROI. Um, and I think Josh said it too earlier, and perhaps it was Rob. One of the real benefits of robotics is you can see the work done, uh, right? We're not paying for, uh, um, you know, a, a database management system or imagery or some sort of um, analytics that um, where the ROI is a little more fuzzy. And while, while certainly could be compelling, is a little bit uh, more difficult to demonstrate. Um, when a farmer walks out and sees that his field is tilled, he knows how much that cost him um, and he knows how much he's paying us. Um, and so making sure that our productivity um, comes at a cost um, equal or less than what he's um, it ready to pay um, makes it makes it quite simple. Um, I won't go into pricing right now, um, but that's sort of that's sort of our barometer. Now, listen, we know that we provide value on top of that, and so one of the key exercises we're doing is opening up the conversation to how can we increase willingness to pay for cust from customers beyond just tilling the field, um, and certainly making inroads there as well. A okay, question from Robin, who is our head of engineering. Hi, Robin. Uh, can you tell us more about how your systems handle robotic control? Do you use a mix of tele operation planning and machine learning? And how do you see that changing over time? Josh, Josh, do you yeah, want I can start? hop in on that. So uh, for us, you know, it's uh, given the nature of the environment, it's difficult to have a uh, continuous high bandwidth communication with the robots. So, you know, we, there are things that we're doing that allows the lo robot to learn by itself. And there are things that we're doing that allows it to communicate its learnings to the cloud so you can update the fleet. Uh, but, you know, things that we're not doing is um, porting information directly to the cloud in every instance and having those resources exist there. So um, that's kind of been the, the hierarchical strategy of how, you know, in how real time is the learning. There's also the, the aspect of this that to a certain extent, you don't always seek to have a machine that's B2B deployed learning in real time. You really want to be able to run tests on what are the most recent models that you have, what are their efficacy before you do an update over the air. Yeah, I think um, I, I, I could have said the exact same thing that Josh just said about our technology too. The, the key thing here to point out, um, we have a strong thesis that, you know, it's we're, we're a long ways away from like quote unquote like lights out farming where no one needs to be on the farm um, and it just sort of happens, you know, without people. I, I think that's a cool idea, but it's kind of unrealistic in a long way out, especially in the context of simplifying the problem. And so what we really seek to do is leverage people um, and keep humans in the loop. Um, so um, if this machine can, you know, operate um, basically by itself with some remote human supervision, that's a big win because that means that one person can monitor a fleet of machines. Um, but in no way am I claiming that we have you know, perfect coverage of every single corner case that this machine could get itself into. Um, we certainly leverage humans um, to, uh, to solve those corner cases as well in real time to keep the operation going. Okay, a question here from Emma Smallwall. At what scale does robotics make sense? Watching this from the UK where our agriculture industry operates 
on a considerably smaller scale than the US giants? Yeah, specifically to us, um, from a, a strategy standpoint, um, and once again, this isn't um, um, this isn't probably what the what the person asking the question wanted to hear. But we need to focus on the largest farms, um, and that's how we survive and thrive. Um, and once we're able to do that, we can continue to provide value um, to to smaller farms as well. But at least from a company strategy standpoint, we do need to go for larger farms. That's not to say that Bearfly can't provide value to your mom and pop farm. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, we as a team are excited about that as well. Um, it's, it's just not, um, it's not where we're focusing our efforts today as far as the sales process goes. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would add, I mean, you think of the first, you know, computer processors and they were focusing on like big like census problems or, or the Manhattan Project. And, you know, you look at the Tesla model and I think the Tesla model is something that we often look at. It's like, look, um, this is already a hard problem. So go after the highest value market. So if you look at it, you know, they're, they're working in, you know, leafy greens, uh, really high value per acre product. It means the robots need to cover the least amount of land with the, and, and land that has the highest amount of value um, per acre. Similarly, greenhouses, right? Um, high value per acre. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, to solve those problems is already hard enough, right? To go and try to, hey, how do we do that so that we could um, do it in, in row crops or, or others where it's gonna be a 10th of the value that's not the problem you want to start solving from day one, right? Because there's still an ocean of customers um, at the very highest end of the market uh, that you should be servicing first. Um, and then as that technology improves, as you scale it, um, you can start to bring down that cost to solve, uh, to take it in other, in, in other solutions. So, uh, Louisa, I think you're muted. Sorry, sorry. There so we've we got go. nine questions and about eight minutes left. So um, let's have just one of you answer each of the next few. Uh, to what extent is system compatibility still an issue? And if so, what needs to happen to mitigate this challenge from Callum Murray? Um, I'll go quick because that applies to us. Um, we, you know, we, we design our, our, technology, our tech stack to be platform independent, whereas you know, the platform in this case is a tractor. Um, so we have interfaces that go between common interfaces on machines and try to um, make as much of our stack um, independent of whatever machine it's operating on. Um, I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking. If you're asking about, you know, architectures and stuff, we use ARM64 and x86, um, you know, pretty standard stuff. Um, we, we use, um, we don't develop hardware in-house. Um, we use, uh, all, all of our hardware is purchased. Okay, Lalitha is asking both of you, so I guess you might have to both have a quick answer. What kind of field data have your robots been able to harvest and will the farmer have ownership of the data collected from RAAS and how can we convert that data into a saleable commodity post farm gate? So um, as far as the data that we're collecting now, uh, we do analytics on you know, what are the populations of product that they have? Uh, what is the expectation for when they ripen? What is the distribution of the farm? A lot of these uh, pieces of information are very actionable. As far as the way that we think about data, uh, we think about data ownership on two levels. Uh, there's the data that's kind of internal to the robot's knowledge of itself that we use to train uh, new models. Uh, that is something that we do aggregate from farms. We do own and um, it's heavily anonymized because it makes for a better system. As far as the, the data that's created that allows a farmer to understand their own operation and where they stand against you know, upcoming orders, stuff like that, crop health, that's what we provide to the grower. That, that is their operational data and it expands the value proposition of using our technology by having them interact with that data. Ditto, exactly the same. Okay. Um, the question from Merritt Jenkins for Agino, what, hold backs, what holds back DEER or Case IH from commercializing full autonomous tractors? Hey Merritt, um, good to hear from you. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, um, we, we play well with New Holland, DEER, Case, um, and others as well. I think they're very invested in autonomous technology, and that's certainly one of the reasons that they want to work with us to do that. Um, I, think they, I think they, like any other large company, have a lot on their plate. Um, they have current features and current machines that they're trying to deploy and win market share on. And certainly they have, um, you know, teams dedicated to frontier technology as well. Um, additionally, too, when we talk about some of these things that Rob brought up earlier about go to market, um, talking directly with the OEMs, they're certainly challenged um, to release, you know, technical products through their existing channels. And so they'll need to rethink that. 
Um, whereas, you know, a company like Bearfly comes in unencumbered from these existing, um, you know, um, dealership channels, which are very beneficial to these OEMs, might I add, but might encumber new technology growth. Um, there's a lot to talk about here, um, probably more than 45 seconds. <laughs> Maybe you can follow up. Uh, so Ryan Phillips is asking, it seems like many of these solutions are quite fragmented fragmented with different special specializations. Do you envisage a full wide range platform approach to solve some of these problems? Is that possible or do you think it's going to continue to be fragmented? Platform, oh, so platform, I platform. We, we would like to be as wide and broad as possible, starting with tillage, going to spraying, planting, cultivating, um, and mechanized harvest as well. I mean, that's where we need to be as a company and, and certainly what our roadmap is. Yeah, so so we're we're building a platform around that dexterous interaction with food. Um, I see that as a generalized problem. That same robot won't be tilling. Um, when you're talking about one of the largest sectors of the global economy, there's an opportunity to create multiple highly capable platforms. But you have to be seeking to build platforms if the technology that you've made such a huge investment in is actually going to be meaningful and scalable. Hey, David Filo is asking, um, he's saying it sounds like you've both had a lot of success, but he's wondering what sort of pushback or um, barriers you've had from growers or owners. Yeah, typically um, what I talk about a lot is when you, when you approach a grower and you say, hey, we have a robotic tractor, they think RoboCop, um, and I'm thinking CNC machine, and there's, there's a gap there. Um, and so um, when, during the sales process, a lot of what I do is just sort of undersell and throw a wet towel on robotics in general and say, hey, listen, this is what we can do. We can do it really well. All those other things, we'll get to those too. Um, but, but here's how we can add value today. I mean, then we, we have a really interesting conversation about, well, you know, can you see wellheads and what happens with dust clouds and what happens when a bearing overheats? And like, yeah, that's, those are the problems we're solving. That's what we can do. Um, and that's really exciting. And so it becomes more of a, um, let's get on this, let's get on this together. Um, Let's, uh, let's develop um, the future together. Um, and that conversation tends to go really well. Alan Sharrock says that in his experience in meatpacking industry, they don't currently have technical skilled workers who could maintain the current machines, much less automation. And the same could be, um, could be the case in other rural ag manufacturing. So how do you think, how do your companies plan on addressing potential skill gaps in workers? So we're, we're looking to collaborate with a variety of technical colleges. In general, when you're talking about automation solutions and the sorts of folks who keep auto manufacturing plants up and running and packaging lines up and running, uh, across the country, there is a deficit in those workers, uh, the number of those workers, and they're actually really good jobs. So we're, we're looking to actually use a variety of community college programs to have educational programs around uh, working with our technology, uh, those are skills are, that would be portable to lots of wonderful jobs and making that investment ourselves. Another one for you, Josh, does Root AI have a business to develop a model where your solution could be integrated with other systems? And if so, any ETA for that developer access? Oh, as far as other systems on the farm? Uh, so we're exploring that now. Um, it's very interesting in our space because in a greenhouse, everything has software and sensors on it. So figuring out uh, where those cut points are between our technology and others and uh, what creates the best experience for a grower, whether where the system of record or the system of engagement is still an active area of exploration for us. Mm -hmm. um, an anonymous attendee is asking, what about the idea of the holistic look into people and process, i.e. the livelihoods of farm helpers? I mean, maybe that's a, a follow on from the question before. Uh, I'll just skip on to the next one since we've got one minute left. How do you see your role going forward when it comes to tech field support at scale, considering the limits of existing dealer channels from Thierry Perogton? Yeah, I'll speak quickly to that. We have to build those into our systems. And I think Josh is doing the same thing. How can we have over the air support, over the air um, teleops and telemetry? Um, how can we give over the air update, software updates to our machines? Um, how can we ensure customer success most directly? Um, and that's, that's a go-to-market problem, and it's also a technical problem, um, and we certainly are solving both. Great. Well, I think we'll end there. Good, fast talking at the end. Thank you so much, everyone, and thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Louisa. Thanks, Bye. guys. See you.